okay, we'll just let the last few people walk on in. Um, while we're doing that, I'll just take a brief moment to introduce myself. Hello, everyone. Great to be here. Hi. <laughs> My name is Eric Charles Hawkinson. I'm originally from the States. Uh, background in IT, but I moved to... Sorry. Is that better? How's that? Much better? Great. So I was saying, uh, my name is Eric Charles Hawkinson, originally from the States. Uh, had a background in IT, worked for Microsoft for a while, and had an interest in Japan pretty much all my life, studied it as an undergrad. And I moved there about 12 years ago and uh, started teaching in K-12. And about six years ago, I moved to higher education. And my IT background and my, my new love of teaching kind of melded together, and now my research is based in learning technology, and in the past oh, five, four or five years, I've been concentrating on one particular emerging technology, which I'd like to share with you my experiences today, and that is augmented reality. So I'm going to start with talking a little bit about the technology and try to conceptualize it for us, and then uh, talk about some of the case uses we've done in K-12 and higher education and some other uh, informal learning environments in Japan. And, and then we'll talk a little about where I think this technology is, is headed, especially in, in, the, in the learning sense in higher education in K-12. So again, my name's Eric. Glad to be here. So just to get, get a little bit about you, how many in the audience here have heard of AR? Hand, raise your hands, please. It's about a little more than half of us, it looks like. How many of you have experienced something in AR? Put hands up. Mm, about the same. How many of you are implementing or using augmented reality in your schools, or your classrooms, or your districts, or your businesses? Uh, not, not many. A, a few, a few. This is kind of indicative of where we are in the technology. Yeah, many people have been coming up to me in the past couple of days, like we're interested in this technology, but we're not quite sure how to use it or where to go. And that's pretty much indicative to what's happening in the broader sense with this technology, because uh, we're, this technology is not new. It's been around for probably about 30 to 40 years in many different ways. But because of the other technologies that are emerging, most notably mobile technology and AI, uh, this technology is beginning to be more ubiquitous in our everyday life. So, AR. Uh, we can, I'm going to try and conceptualize this in a couple of different ways, but first I'd just like to get some of the, the jargon, some of the terminology uh, straight. There's been a lot of buzzwords that have been happening back and forth between mixed reality, virtual reality, augmented reality, but the research is quite clear and established on these terms. So we have, right now, we're in the real world conversing with each other, but you can argue, actually, I'm slightly augmented with the visuals behind me. And then there's the completely simulated environment of virtual reality, maybe like something like a, closer to a video game, or the VR headsets that we're seeing now uh, coming out from Vive and such. But uh, we have virtual reality, which is closer to reality, and something else closer to the more simulated environment. But that whole spectrum in between the completely real and the completely virtual is called mixed reality. And that's a term that we're hearing more and more these days, and you're going to hear more of it uh, moving towards the future because it's all encompassing of all these, the whole spectrum of how much digital is being integrated in our real world. Just to give us a little bit of context, uh, I'm going to be a little bit, give an admission. But th this is kind of a, because I think this technology is kind of a good metaphor for learning technologies in general and about how they're impacting the way we learn and how we uh, communicate and take in information from the world. So um, I got caught a few times in elementary school cheating, looking in the back of the book for the answers. And my mom would always tell me, you know, you're never going to have a magic box to give you all that, you know, all the answers in the world. But actually, you kind of, kind of have one now. And so, it's kind of, kind of a bad thing to say. But I think I was actually kind of 
cultivating my 21st century skills by cheating in elementary school. And that kind of straight A to B, without any discovery, without any uh, going through the process of learning and getting the answer right away with this just-in-time information uh, systems that we're building with MOOCs and mobile technology is going to be exacerbated by this augmented reality technology because it's going to take all that information and start placing it so ubiquitously in the physical world around us. So another way to, to think about this is actually as a medium for which to deliver content. And we have a, a long relationship with how we have used these mediums to deliver educational content, going back a very long history, of course. And we've gone from print to recording to cinema radio, and each one is compounded on the richness and the ease of delivery and how we can communicate. And now, recently, with the mobile technology, break out my phone again, now we have all those things in our pockets. We have radio, TV, television, and all that good stuff around with us in our pockets. But what augmented reality is going to do is going to take it out of our pockets again and connect all these other mass mediums to every physical thing, place, person around us. Uh, one way to kind of analogize this is uh, young people today, they might go up to a TV and try to swipe it. Right? So this is going from, yes, a couple people have that experience. So this is a person that's in the mobile era using a piece of technology from the television era. But now you take that a step forward, and now the next child is going to go up to a door or a chest of drawers and try and swipe it. Because they think that physical content is somehow connected digitally to some uh, effect that might happen to their physical reactions to it. So here's an example of some of the first uses of it, right? So we have a heads-up display in a uh, commercial airliner, right? So his reality is being augmented by instrumentation in the flight deck of how fast he's going, how high he is, and his direction. And we're going to see some more of this. We already see some of this in, in our cars, right? In our navigation systems. We're going to start seeing it on our glasses. And we already see it in places like tourism and also in the classroom. So this is uh, where I'm from in Kyoto, Japan. It's usually very busy. This is called Kawadamachi Street in Kyoto. This is 4 in the morning, so it's a very rare case where there's nobody to ask for directions. And so a good use that's already being implemented about this technology is in tourism. So you hold up your phone, right? And your phone has a bunch of data that it can call upon to help augment what's going on around you. So it knows your location due to the GPS locator. It knows what direction you're facing and how you're moving due to some gyros and other sensors in your phone. And now it's going to use the camera to take in some visual information and try to match that up with something that's already on, on the internet. So now it knows some actual physical things that might be happening in your field of view. And now you can overlay on that some information, like you're looking to get some information I'm um, sorry, looking to get some cash from ATM. And it gets even more uh, um, widespread use when you connect it to your social accounts, right? So now you know where your friends are. And this is already being implemented in tourism quite on a large scale. And terminology-wise, in augmented reality, we kind of, you kind of have two things happening. First, you have a trigger, and then you have an overlay. And a trigger is something that triggers an event digitally. And that could be as simple as your GPS location, or a physical object that your camera picks up in front of you, or uh, someone else with some sort of Internet of Things device coming within your area. Some data coming in that triggers an event. And then you have an overlay, some digital co content that's pre-programmed to put over the real world when that trigger happens. So in this case, your trigger is your GPS location and what's happening in front of you visually, and the overlay is some relevant information from your social feeds. Uh, another kind of analogy to think about this technology is a, it's a bridge. When it's used correctly, you don't really notice your bridge, and this analogy works on a couple of different levels. Uh, 
because um, it connects people in time and space, um, connects people from great distances, it connects people from real and digital. But um, as a technology, this kind of works as far as how our brains work too. So it's, it's, if this is the first time you're crossing this bridge, and it's a big, beautiful bridge, you might be a little less concentrated on driving and the road in front of you, and a little more thinking about the beautiful view and how high you are up off the, either the ocean or the floor or the ground or whatever. And this is indicative of how first people, first time users of this technology feel when trying to take in the content that's a, that we're trying to deliver using it. Because it's kind of been established that using this technology is actually such a fundamental new way of experiencing and taking in information that we first time users have a hard time actually taking in the content that we're using this technology to deliver and kind of concentrating on the what's happening with the technology itself. And also, you see this, these graphics here, but that has a second meaning too, because actually if you were using one of my augmented reality apps, you would see some different content behind me. This is called, this is a trigger. And this is also a bridge in, in the fact that now we're kind of taking a step back in the freedom of information and we're, we can lock information to physical objects, like a card or a physical location on, on, the, on the earth. So now this bridge can have a toll or, or a block or a key involved in getting across it. So now if you're privileged enough to have this software in your phone and looking at the screen right now, you'll get a completely different amount of information than people looking at it uh, straight away. But as educators, right, we want to use this technology to help deepen our understanding uh, for our students. So uh, for the past couple, four, four or five years, I've been trying to implement this technology in different ways to help students connect the physical things around them, the people around them, where they are physically work, to deeper, more uh, meaningful learning by integrating uh, other media and contents for literature. So talking about what this is doing to our brains, right? So thinking about the learning content that was being delivered in a phone. Like in, in our mobile era, we are remembering phone numbers less. We're not committing a lot of other things to our short-term memory because we can call on them whenever we want. And this is going to get, again, exacerbated by this technology. So just to give an example, Let's say I'm wearing a heads-up display that recognizes faces. And I walk up to someone and it augments them with a name above your head. Now, does that mean that I'm going to remember your name more or less? I don't know, really. But the chances of that happening, being able to commit things to long-term memory, when things are displayed to us, even without asking, and that's the big thing. Getting answers without asking, being able to formulate questions is the real danger to the discovery and learning process that I think that I see in this technology. The example I like to use for this phenomenon is there's already, uh, is there any biology fans here? Or botany perhaps? At least a botany example. Um, there's already an app available where you can take out your phone and point it at a flower and then your phone will determine where you are in the world, kind of reason out what kind of flowers might be growing in your area, then take in the visual data and, and compare the picture to thousands of other photographs already available on the web and tell you what exactly that species of flower that is. Which is great if you want to go from A to B and know the answer, but there's a whole host of things that we like to discover and go through as a learner to get to that process, right? So it's, it's giving us a shortcut, like the example I gave earlier. So we, we don't think about where we are and where the flower might be, or how many petals are involved. And try, it's trying to deduce for ourselves and ask the questions that we formulate to get that answer. We go straight to the answer. Now let's talk about how we might think about the different ways AR is, and what, what types might be available to use. And I, I have this extensive, at the, I might be going a little bit fast, but at the end it's okay, I have everything, all my research is publicly available, I'm going to put that up at the end so you can go and revise and look at it up later. So I've talked about this extensively, so I might go a little bit fast through it. So, types of AI, you can categorize it in the way I said before, how real is it or how virtual is it? 
Is it completely virtual? Are you only using slight elements of the real world? Or are you using almost the real world and just putting a few other digital elements on top of it? Uh, who's played Pokemon Go? Everyone knows AR because of Pokemon Go. It's a thing I've been here at my university. <laughs> what are you doing with this AR stuff? Oh, can you do some more of this Pokemon Go stuff after the fact? So, anyway. so th that is a level sort of somewhere in the middle, right? So you're chasing digital creatures, but you're actually walking around in the real world. That's one way to think about it. The other way is to think about it is what kind of data you're using to pull in information and then track it and change it to augment what's happening in your reality. And you can track that with your camera and there's a few different ways you can use your camera to take in data. You can use a marker or a pre-described uh, illustration or painting or picture. Or you can look for something like movement. And then you can do some things like non-tracking. Like I said before, your phone has other things that can give you data, like your movement and your GPS location, and you can combine those things. And this is going to get even better as we move towards the Internet of Things, as we get sensors that we can connect into things like our Fitbit and things like that. We get all sorts of data that will augment what we see in our world. You can also think about this as always on or on when we want it. So. Augmented in real time in 3D is very cool because you're looking at things in real time and things are being tracked and overlaid digitally in real world, but you can also just use a picture, like the flower example I just like I said before. But this comes into issues of privacy, especially in education, right? Because uh, one of the reasons there was a little bit of pushback by this Google Glass thing that we had then went and came is having a camera that's always on and what do you do perhaps when you go to the restroom or things like that? And all that data is being collected about you and what, you, what do you do about it? There's already been a lot of districts in California that in the states that are pushing back against augmented reality because they take in so much data about the user. They know where they, they've been over the course of the day because you need to be augmented and gathering data as far as where you are physically in the world and what information you're seeing around you. It can be potentially dangerous as far as the privacy issue goes. And then it doesn't have to be on your person, right? You can also augment things like video. You can stick a movie in and then augment whatever a certain character pops in, have some something display on top of it. So you can think about this as augmenting your own personal perspective of the world or somebody else's. Or then you can also take that forward and back in time. And then there's different ways you can play with that too. So there's a couple of different ways to think about augmenting your reality. And this is just a little fun example to show you some a combination of those things. This is an app that came out in Japan four, four years ago, much before Pokemon Go. And basically it looks for cylindrical objects. And then it turns that cylindrical object into something from which you can fish from. And then you, then it takes the motion sensors in your phone and you flip the cast or cast the line into the cup and then you use your finger to reel in the fish. And your physical location in the world depends what kind of fish you pull out of that cylindrical object. And it doesn't have to be a cup, it could be a ball or anything round, right? So this is a combination of all the different sensors and you're pulling out some uh, fun fish. And this was very popular, not very popular, but somewhat popular in Japan, way before the Pokemon Go fans. Right, so that's a little bit about AR. Uh, I'm going to talk, how much, however, however much time I have, about some of these cases. I have about a dozen of them, and again, I have most of this stuff available online, so I don't get to all of them, or I skip over one. I can tell you where to go see that information later. Uh, the first impl implementation I did with this about four years ago was with textbooks uh, for English education in Japan. I published a textbook five or six years ago and I went back and I redesigned it to optimize it for augmented reality. And so, for, for example, there was a dialogue in the book. You point your phone at that dialogue, it recognized some images close to it. You could hear that dialogue or you could see a video of some real world context revolving around the contents of that dialogue. You can, see, you can see here that the design of it had to be, there's a lot of white space involved because you're going to fill it up with digital information. So you have to have a design uh, concept, a design, design aesthetic that takes in like sort of a web design aesthetic and a print design aesthetic and kind of meld them together in this kind of environment. 
But um, I, I gave up on this uh, a year and a half down the road. And one reason is, is um, I found this to be a little bit redundant. Uh, a lot of students, this has this technology has a lot of big novelty effect, especially in the beginning, like the bridge concept I told you about earlier. And it motivates students to use it just for the play aspect of it, the motivational aspect of it. So what I found is that when I was linking to these supplementary materials on the web, they're usually YouTube videos that I created on a specific YouTube channel, or we're doing things on Quizlet to quiz vocabulary or check uh, meanings of words in their native language. They, find, they started figuring out where that exactly was on the web or what app that would open, and they stopped using the augmented reality application. And while I was happy that this changed behaviors in at least some students, I realized that that the, the learning value of that product or that, that idea, that concept, uh, wasn't that great. Because if you're going to just show some YouTube videos on a piece of paper, why not just tell the students where that YouTube channel is because almost all students know how to do that already. So I evolved, evolved on that. And what I found is, is that this technology works a lot better when you start moving around and inter integrating, interacting with things around you in the physical world. So this is an example we had at the, our media center. We had some volunteer students there that usually give guided tours of the area. Uh, we have, it's open to the public, so people come in. And so I asked them to take a project I've been doing and try to do, make something for when they're not there. And what they came up with is this uh, sort of like a scavenger hunt. You came in, they, they created a narrative. One person was a police chief and the other was a thief. And you came in and you put your phone, your application at a poster, and you got a video from the police chief saying that some piece of information has been stolen and we need your help. And after that you got a clue, a hint, which brought you to another part of the library, in which case you got another hint, which might make you look up a book and open it to a certain page and find another card. And then again and again and again. And through this whole process, they map this out first and using the triggers they used. Through this whole process, it took about 20 to 30 minutes. Using your own discovery, your own way through the library, you learn the facilities at the library, how to look up a book and find a periodical, and basically knew how to get around the library. It's a great, it was a great tool, kind of gamified the process of getting oriented to the, to the uh, media center. There's a couple other examples. Um, I'm involved with TEDx Kyoto. Uh, we have our event every year in October, and we use it as a communication tool to bridge what was happening online, talking about what were people talking about online in the event, and where people were actually at the event. And we were linking things like past talks of our current speakers all around the event so people could walk on and store the menu and learn about um, a little deeper way and try to interact on a digital level with our speakers and our volunteers. We've been using this in tourism too, for uh, in Japan, for example, most of the, especially in rural areas, all of the information on posters are in Japanese. So you put that into an application, and then when it, that poster gets recognized, you can have a setting in your phone that would give you localized information or information in the language that you specify. Breakout EU is another thing um, that I've collaborated with, and we had a special session on that this morning. Anybody here that would play Breakout with us this morning? No? Um, I have more about that online. I'm starting to run out of t time, so I'm going to skip over that one. But um, again, you can find more videos on that. Let's talk about briefly about where uh, this might be headed. Um, so thanks to Pokemon Go, we learned a lot of things about the, the social ramifications of connecting a lot of digital things in the real world. Uh, things like people jumping fences in golf courses to catch rare digital creatures that weren't actually there. Uh, people walking into places they shouldn't be, people getting into fatal car accidents, because their mind is split between something that's not really there in the digital world and something that's there in the real world. And as far as technology goes, this was a great lesson because this kind of helped us realize where we are in the span of the, using this technology in the classroom. Because this, this phenomenon was a huge hit. They, were, they overtook Twitter and the, the number of users in the first two weeks. Uh, they were they made the most amount of money in the fastest amount of time, but they're hemorrhaging users something like 15 million per week, and that is once again because of the bridge concept I spoke about a little bit earlier. So 
after you've done this, it's, it's not novel anymore, and you're grinding to find new Pokemon, and you maybe found the ones that you nostalgic about. It's another thing. The IP kind of fit the demographic, right? Uh, people that played this game maybe in their teens, as the Nintendo, was the right time for them to, because they all had credit cards and phones, and were able to want to be a little bit nostalgic and break back into this game. And what we also saw with this is that uh, the monetization factor in this is a little bit dangerous and it goes back to the privacy issue I mentioned earlier. Uh, Pokemon Go made a lot of money because they made it on both ends. They were charging users for a virtual content that we use in the game like Pokeballs to catch Pokemon, but they were also collecting all this information about foot traffic and trying to help direct foot traffic to certain areas by offering these things called poke stops and gyms in specific areas. And even in Japan, um, the governor of Kyoto, where I'm from, spoke to the head of uh, Nintendo to see if they could form some sort of partnership where they could use this to benefit tourism. So people there, for example, also McDonald's in Japan, paid a large amount of money to make every one of their McDonald's a poke stop so people, students or children would want to go visit and catch poke. But I think I see this as a way for us to kind of uh, form a greater empathy because now we can use this technology to bridge uh, first person views and how we experience the world in a more meaningful way. Uh, anybody know about the hype cycle of emerging technologies? So it's kind of like, woohoo, new technology, let's all get excited about it. Like, oh, it doesn't work. This is exactly where we are with Pokemon Go, right? Whoa, new augmented reality, let's try it out. Well, this is not so great because it kind of oversold the technology. We're kind of in a disappointment trough right now with this technology, and then it's going to start pulling out. But all these other technologies coming behind it, like the Internet of Things and AI, are going to help um, the use and the effectiveness of this tool. So moving ahead, uh, the hardware that's coming out soon is going to really help this technology. Um, us as humans, we have to self sense depth to really understand the world around us. And our phones are really limited in the way they can see and perceive the world because they only have one camera. And even the latest iPhone has dual cameras. And most of the higher end phones coming out late this year and next year and from that point forward, are going to have dual cameras in them. And that's specifically to help with augmented reality. So now you can move your phone if you're moving around. The phone will be able to sense something that's how far away it is in relation to other things behind it. So you, and if using that sort of technology, you, can, you might actually have a Pokemon peek its head around the wall or something. Um, all the major players are spending collective billions on this technology, uh, Apple, Google, and Microsoft with their HoloLens, of course, and they all have major things coming out, if not next year, the year after that. So you can expect to see this either hardware or software coming out in droves starting yesterday. And like I said before, the Internet of Technology, all these things that help gather data about us, like our Fitbits and uh, location near field sensors, are all going to play a role in and AI helping us decipher and putting all this information together to help augment the world around us. <coughs> and these are some of the things that you can also see in, in the far future. They still have some social things we need to work out with the privacy issue and um, being able to be accepted wearing a camera on your face at all times. But these things are already available commercially. Uh, I've tried most of them out. And there we have a lot of first case uses in Japan as well. And you can bet to see a lot of more of these, uh, especially next year and the year after that. And this is when it's starting to get really ubiquitous. Because if you have a computer on your face and you're able to overlay information on top of it, this is when we're going to start to get really deep into this straight to the answer type thinking and mentality. Like what we have in our pockets right now, we'll have it already answered for us without, again, having to ask the deep questions about what we're seeing and who's guiding that bridge and who's telling you and what information is being driven into your eyeballs literally without you even asking for it. Uh, we're going to have to ask some very deep and very um, important questions about who's delivering that information, when and how and why. 
All right, good timing. About, my time's just about up. Again, as promised, my name is Eric Hawkinson. You can find all my research available online at my current website. And um, all my social information is there. Please be my friend. <laughs> and if you see me around, I have a booth downstairs too. I'm not a business or a startup or anything, just came to share some knowledge. So if you want to stop by and say hi, I'd like that too. And thanks very much for your time. I think I didn't leave time for questions, but we can talk later if you want. Thank you very much, Eric. Um, I'm delighted now to be able to introduce Terakia, Dr. Terakia Jerome Satasitsin, who's the Deputy Minister of Education for the Ministry of Education in Thailand. Mobilization. I think I'm just a uh Yeah. 